Hello and welcome. I'm Lauren. And I'm Lena. And this is Pass Me the Booze, a paranormal podcast where we discuss the history and hauntings of local and not so local places while partaking in adult booverages. In each episode, we share a different haunted place and pair it with a drink. This week, Halloween, Halloween special. special. Part one. Part two to follow. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So this week, we will be discussing a little bit about the history of Halloween, and then we will get into some... Some uh, dangerous Halloween games that you guys can play if you want, if you're feeling ballsy enough. We will read through some instructions, mm-hmm. um, and we will not be playing these games. <laughs> I'm letting you know that right now, Lauren. <laughs> No, not in my house not anyway. Happening. I'm too big of a chicken. Yeah. It's not going to happen not here, but. But it will, we will read the directions. And if we know anything or have friends, family, dead ones who have played the games. <laughs> yeah. If anyone else wants to play the games, let us know if you do it. But it's going to take a lot of coaxing for us, I think, to uh, do anything. But... Yeah. So what's what's our drink this week? What did you bring me? So we were having a hard time finding a drink for the theme of this week. Yeah, because there's just a lot. It, there's a lot. It's Halloween. But I did find a cider donut hard cider by Ship Bottom Brewery. I am not sure where in Jersey, Pennsylvania area that they are located, but I know it's local. And I had something similar last year and it was really really good from ship bottom so mm. i'm excited to try this yeah me because too. it says donut on it yeah i've never had any kind of drink that's has donut in the description so i'm interested to see what that tastes like like i'm really hoping this tastes like a donut mm. like well, an apple donut or something yeah well let's let's try it see, okay see how it is I, I did something sacrilegious and I cracked mine open before we oh, started recording. I didn't even realize. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take a sip yet, though. Okay. I just, right. I wanted to smell it. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Okay. It tastes really good. It tastes really good, but like, <laughs> I, I don't wait. So it, it just tastes like a really, really good, sweet, hard cider. Mm-hmm. It is very sweet. And uh, recalling the taste of apple cider donuts. I do, I do taste that in there. I don't know how. Yeah, but it's there. It's there. <laughs> it's it's kind of like drinking an apple cider donut, mm-hmm. which donut in liquid form. Yeah, reading reading the the title cider donut, maybe. I'm. <laughs> no, yeah, I think it's um, <laughs> planted that in my mind. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's like it's like apple pie. Yes. Like our last drink with the, or not last drink, I, how many drinks ago was that? Oh, yeah, that was, um, I think that was the North Coventry episode, was it? The um, apple wine run, right? Yeah. Did that, was that North Coventry? No, that wasn't. I don't know. It wasn't. Oh, it was uh, Alba Twitch. Alba, Alba Twitch. Twitch. Oh, yeah, Albie. <laughs> the apples. How, how on earth could we forget <laughs> Albie already? Jeez. Oh, man. That's how long it's been. <laughs> been quite a week it's been quite a week mercury's in retrograde again and my car is in the shop again it seems to happen every retrograde just something's wrong with my car it's fine mine's about to go in there too because like i don't have brakes right now oh that's safe that's so 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 safe so so, (laughs) all right it's super duper safe and like driving back here from lancaster Mm -hmm. in the pouring rain the torrential downpour yeah. that we got the other day as i was driving i was like oh i feel safe oh my god that's terrifying <laughs> so my car needs brakes yeah it does it's, it's gonna get some brakes this week same thing kind of happened with my car except it wasn't the brakes like uh i have a little screen on my car uh, that gives me notifications if something's wrong and it literally said as i was driving home from work the, the one day engine not available what <laughs> i'm just like what do you mean it's not available <laughs> and it just stopped working and i couldn't like move the car properly so i just kind of coasted into a nearby parking lot and just stayed there Mm -mm. Mm -mm. (laughs) but 
see, I'm I'm so bad with stuff like this that my dumbass would have been like pulled over to the side, turned the car off, waited a few minutes, and then turned the car back on to see if I could make it work again. I can make this work. I can make it home. No, I can't. I it's... literally can't reverse. <laughs> you don't need to reverse. You need to go forward. <laughs> yep. So there's that. Or figuring out adult life. It's fine. Oh, God. <laughs> I needed this drink. Same. <laughs> so this will come out on Friday the... Uh, yeah, this coming Friday. Yeah. Because we're actually recording, we're like... like, a week out. Yeah, usually we do them, like, weeks in advance, but... We're pretty on, on point right now. <laughs> but, see, so, yeah, it'll come out the 22nd. Yeah, so, if you live in the general area, I'm doing a plug really fast because mm-hmm. it's that time of month. Um, Gwyneth Mercy University is doing a Walk a Mile in Her Shoes event. Ooh. on saturday the 23rd um it's a foundation that does a lot of really good stuff mm-hmm. their title nine coordinator who is orchestrating it organizing it is bob wood he is a fantastic advocate um for really everyone and if you can make it out and donate some money please do i'll yes. be there uh, where is that again? Gwynedd Mercy University. So it's out by, it's out in like Bluebell. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's good. literally, if if you know where Bluebell campus of Monco is. Yeah, I used to go there. Two minutes down the road. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Sweet. What time is that again? I <laughs> know this. Hold on. This is how bad I am at doing stuff like this. Out of, just pulling it out of my ass really fast. Hold on. Because <laughs> I'm very excited for this. And Okay. So, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. at Gwen and Mercy University. Okay. Um, and if you want to learn more about what a walk a mile in her shoes is, you can go to www.walkamileinhershoes.org. Awesome. Thank yeah. you for that. It's about that time of year where I do those, and I'm organizing one for my school that I work at, too. So Good. It's all fun and games. Yeah. Speaking of. Speaking of. Let's get into a bit of the history. Yeah, tell me. Why do we celebrate spooky season? Yeah, okay. Our, our holiday. Our holiday. Our Christmas. It is. <laughs> so Halloween's origins date back to ancient, ancient, I can speak, I promise, <laughs> God, uh, ancient Celtic festivals of Samhain. Uh, the Celts, who lived roughly 2,000 years ago, uh, in mostly the Ireland, United Kingdom, Northern France area, or what we know of as those areas now, right. uh, celebrated their new year on November 1st. Ooh. And this time of year marked the ending of summer and of the harvest and of like the plentiful season. Mm-hmm. And it was the beginning of the dark, cold winter that was often associated with a lot of people dying. Y- yeah. <laughs> so they believed that the night before the new year, the boundary between the worlds of the living and the dead became blurred Mm. so that on the 31st they would celebrate Samhain in a celebration that kind of was like the ghosts are coming back and they're gonna fuck with our crops and um gonna die everything's gonna die but also they thought that druids or celtic priests yes uh were able to make more accurate predictions about the future Oh, because on these the, nights? the veil was so thin. Yes. They were they were in touch with that world. Yeah. That's really cool. So, like, part of their rituals were bonfires mm. and dressing up normally in costumes that, like, consisted of animal heads and skins and antlers. Mm-hmm. And they would try and read each other's fortunes. And people would depend on these ceremonies because it was a very important source of comfort uh, during you know, the long, uncertain period of time where a lot of people died because of the weather conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would host those and they would burn crops and animal sacrifices to Celtic deities. Mm -hmm. And then after the celebration was over, they would relit their hearth fires, uh, which they would all extinguish earlier in the evening. And they would use flames from the sacred bonfire Mm -hmm. to help protect them during the coming winter. Because it was like, um, it had more power behind it, I guess. Mm-hmm. So they would use that fire specifically to help them survive the winter. Yeah. That's cool. It's very cool. So then enter in the Roman Empire. 
<laughs> Welcome. Welcome. So by roughly, I think the date I found was 43 AD, <laughs> um, the Roman Empire had conquered the majority of everywhere, mm-hmm. but uh, almost all of Celtic territory was under Roman Empire. And in the course of the 400 years that they ruled those lands, uh, two of the festivals of Roman origin were combined with the traditional Celtic celebration of Samhain. Ooh. Because the Romans also had something that they did um, to honor the dead and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. it kind of all got beautifully meshed together. Um, and I'm going to butcher the, the <laughs> word. Uh, the first was Feralia, F-E-R-A-L-I-A. Feralia. Yeah, a day in late October when the Romans traditionally um, commemorated the passing of the dead. Okay. And the second day was Pomona, P-O-M-O-N-A. So, f- f- P- Pomona. Pomona and what was it? Feralia. Feralia. Uh, so the second day was uh, a day where they honored a Roman goddess of, like, fruit, trees, you know, the, mm-hmm. the plentiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the symbol of Pomona is the apple. And the incorporation of this celebration into Samhain explains probably the um, the bobbing for apples that oh. we do now. <laughs> yeah. So fun, fun facts. Um, however, it would not last this beautiful combination of things. N- not, it never does. Never does. Because on May 13th, 609 AD, uh-huh. Pope Boniface the Fourth uh, dedicated the Pantheon in Rome in honor of all Christian martyrs, and the Catholic feast of All Martyrs Day was established. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Here come the Christians. Oh no no no! Here come the Catholics. Here, Here it's, it's Catholics. different. <laughs> Gonna fuck up your day. Uh, afterward, Pope Gregory the Third then expanded this festival to include All Saints Day as well as all martyrs, and was moved from being observed in May mm-hmm. to November first, right after, the- as <laughs> kind of a way of like Christianizing Samhain, kind of their way of like balancing it out, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> So um, by the 9th century, the influence of Christianity had spread through Celtic lands Mm -hmm. where it gradually blended with um, older Celtic rites. By 1000 AD, the church made November 2nd All Souls Day Mm -hmm. to honor the dead. And it's widely believed that the church was attempting to replace the Christian or the the Celtic festival um, of the dead with a related church sanctioned holiday. Ah, so. Here's my thing. Here's, okay. here's what I love about this. Um, well, wait, let me let me read this next bit of tidbit that I have, and then I'll get into <laughs> my spiel here about this. So All Souls Day was celebrated similarly to Samhain, with big bonfires, parades, being dressed up in costumes. Um, specifically, their costumes were of the saints, mm. angels, and devils. Cool. Um, all Saints Day celebration was all also called All Hallows or All Hallowmas mm. from the Middle English All Hallowmas. So All Hall All Hallowmas. So the word is all one A L H O L O W M E S S E, which also mm. just meant All Saints Day. Okay. <laughs> uh, and the night before the traditional night of Samhain in Celtic religion, Mm -hmm. began to be called All Hallows' Eve, which then eventually turned into Halloween. Halloween! Don't you love how language, like, works? (laughs) It just transforms over time. I love the, I love the, like, flow of it. Yeah. So, here's my spiel. Yes. (laughs) So, recently, as I'm scrolling through, like, the new video functioning, like, you know how now TikToks are kind of, like, on Snapchat and Instagram? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, I, like, when I'm bored and I have nothing to do and I have office hours and no one's coming to visit me, I will sit there and I will scroll through them. Oh, yeah. For like maybe 20 minutes max because <laughs> I need to cap that stuff. It's very easy to fall into a TikTok hole it or really anything is. like it. <laughs> but I found, because I follow on my personal account, like a lot of the people I follow are very Christian oriented mm-hmm. because I worked with a lot of 
people right. and I was at a faith-based institute for a while. So they, they aim certain episodes at me. I think because they think that I'm going to like them. Ah. <laughs> but a lot of them recently has been moms talking about why they don't let their kids celebrate Halloween. Oh, God. Because it's the devil's holiday. Sure. <laughs> now, I very clearly have just read to you <laughs> how the Catholic Church fucking took over this holiday. Yeah. And what we celebrate now is just direct correlation to what the Catholic Church was doing. Exactly. They made it their own holiday, so it's not about the the devil. It never really was. No. <laughs> it never really was at all. Do your research, But James. like like come on, Karen. You you were telling you were telling me that you don't let your kid go out dressed up like a fucking ninja. <laughs> to get candy for free. So this is, yeah, this is your educational part of the podcast. Here is your fuel to to negate any kind of Karen's argument that Halloween is the devil's holiday. No, it's genuinely, it was created <laughs> by the church. Um, And even when it came to America, Halloween was limited in uh, colonial New England because, and here's where this belief from the frickin' Karens come from. Um, Protestants did not like this. Mm-hmm. It was super Catholic. Mm-hmm. And they still associated it with, like, it being evil because the Catholic Church and Protestant eyes is evil. Right. Um, so it was very limited in colonial England, New England because of where the Protestants were located. Mm-hmm. However, Halloween became much more common in, like, Maryland and in the southern colonies because... They weren't as Protestant. As the beliefs and customs of different European ethnic groups and the American Indians meshed, Mm -hmm. a distinctly American version of Halloween began to emerge. Uh, The first celebrations included play parties where uh, public events were held to celebrate the harvests and neighbors would share the stories of the dead and tell each other's fortune and sing and dance. That sounds so fun. It sounds like so much was fun. Uh, Colonial Halloween festivals also featured ghost, like telling ghost stories and mischief making of all kinds. (laughs) By the middle of the 19th century, annual autumn festivals were common, but Halloween was not yet celebrated everywhere in the country. Right. In the second half of the 19th century, America was flooded with new immigrants. These new immigrants, especially the millions of Irish... (laughs) They're like, hey, we know Fleeing about this. the Irish potato famine. Yep. <laughs> helped to popularize the celebration of Halloween nationally. Mm-hmm. So because we had people coming from Ireland yeah. where it basically even originated. It, it originated pretty much with the Celts. And they kind of kept a lot of those um, superstitions and those yeah. beliefs alive, even with the Christianizing it and even with like... England kind of taking them over and killing their language and stuff like that. Like they, yeah. they still kept some of the the like beliefs and the the values. Yeah. So I guess when they when they finally came to America and they saw what was going on, they're just like, oh no 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 no, we're gonna spice this up a bit. Kind of, but they're also <laughs> more just like, well, fuck the Protestants. We're celebrating <laughs> Halloween. We're, we're celebrating, dude. Step aside. We'll show you how it's done. Get out your jack o' lanterns because <laughs> we carving pumpkins. Um, so borrowing some European traditions, Americans dressed up in costumes and would go home to home asking for food or money, uh, a practice that eventually became today's trick or treat tradition. (laughs) Just knocking on people's doors. Give me your money, please. Give me, give me food. Give me money. (laughs) Well, and I don't know about you, but you, oh, well, you know, you came trick or treating with us a little, like in my development when we were in elementary school. Do you remember that? Yes. Just I'm sure more than once. Oh, many times. But it was it was safer because it was more blocked off and it wasn't mm-hmm. a dark wooded hill Eat. where cars were not watching children. It's very impossible. It was impossible to trick or treat where I lived because I literally was in the middle of the woods. Yeah, so she would come to where <laughs> we lived, which was not in the middle of the woods. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but someone actually did give out like pennies. Oh. And I never understood it. But I was doing this research. I'm like, oh, that's why. Because they're like real traditional. And it was an older couple that would do it. That's so cool. I don't remember that. but I just, I just remember we would, in the basement, dump out the candy and we'd have to check candy. I remember the one year when we were like, um, 
when we were going through our candy and like trading or whatever, we, we I specifically remember we were watching George of the Jungle in your basement. I don't know why, but that's like a very big memory just ingrained in my brain. I think it's because that was one of the years where like you, Natalie, and your mom slept over. Yeah, no, it was definitely a sleepover night. Yeah. <laughs> Cuz like I think I don't think that that was the um the cat suit and the disco diva Halloween. No, ne- that was at year. your your next house. You're the one that you're in now. Yeah. No. Um <laughs> but it was definitely one of those years where my 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 father had bought alcohol mm-hmm. to like share but your mom also bought alcohol to share yep. and by the next morning there was no more alcohol to share and they Sounds were the only point. two drinking yep <laughs> that tracks <laughs> so like i think i remember that <laughs> but the, no there was there was an older couple and they would give us pennies and i never understood why uh, honestly i think in my young mind at that point i thought that they were just being jerks Where's the fucking candy? Yeah. But no, it was it was traditional. Um, I appreciate that now. Yeah. But also there was a belief that among young women that on Halloween, they could divine the name or appearance of their future husband by doing tricks with yarn, apple parings, or mirrors. Ooh. So I couldn't find like what those tricks actually entailed because, you know, not many historians are like let me just focus on this one little aspect here but they genuinely did believe that they could find their future husbands yeah i'd like to know the specifics i would too i'll, I'll try and do more for that one there um, has to be some historian that's mainly fixated on halloween tradition there i would hope there has to be <laughs> i mean there's totally is but i just did not find much mm-hmm. surprisingly um so in the late 1800s there was a move in america to mold halloween into a holiday more about community and neighborly get-togethers mm. than about ghosts and pranks and witchcraft, which was probably like, um, you know, the the push to become more wholesome. Right. To really, like, achieve the American dream of wholesome for family, nuclear families. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so at the turn of the century, Halloween parties for both children and adults became the most common way to celebrate, and parties focused on games, food, and festive costumes. Yeah. So, and the games would be things like bobbing for apples. Mm-hmm. They would do jack lantern carvings and other such activities while the foods were traditionally seasonal and, you know, costumes were costumes. <laughs> yeah. But they did move away from just dressing up as either saints, angels, or devils. Yeah. They're like, let's get some variety in here. I've worn the same costume for the past three years. It's time, it's time to jazz it up yeah um parents were encouraged by newspapers and community leaders to take anything quote unquote frightening or grotesque out of halloween celebrations um because of these efforts halloween lost most of its superstitious and religious overtones by the beginning of the 20th century until until (laughs) uh by the 1920s and 30s halloween had become a secular community-centered holiday Mm mm-hmm with parade or parades and townwide Halloween parties as the featured entertainment. Um, however, despite best efforts from many schools and communities, vandalism began to plague some celebrations in many communities at the time. Yeah, it really took the whole uh, mischievous tradition and really ran with it. Yeah. And that's why we have Mischief Night now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, by the 1950s, town leaders had successfully limited vandalism and Halloween had evolved into a holiday directly me or so um so by the 50s they had successfully limited the vandalism and halloween was now just a holiday directed at young kids mm. so due to high numbers of young children during the 50s thank you baby boomers <laughs> looking at you um parties moved from town civic centers into the classrooms or home where they could be more easily accommodated mm. Uh, However, the practice of trick-or-treating was also revived between 1920 and 1950. Mm -hmm. And it was a relatively inexpensive way for an entire community to share the Halloween celebration. In theory, families could also prevent tricks from being played on them by providing the neighborhood children with treats. (laughs) Hence, trick or treating. (laughs) 
Uh, thus, the new American tradition was born, and it's continued to grow. Today, Americans spend an estimated of $6 billion annually on Halloween. Holy Making shit. it the country's largest commercial holiday after Christmas. <laughs> fun fact. Hold on, let me find my fun fact. I love a fun fact. More people are buying costumes for their pets. <laughs> so Americans spend typically, or no, wait. So in 2019, Americans spent $490 million on costumes for their pets alone. I was part of that. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it was more than double what they spent in 2010. Oh no. So we have spent a lot on this holiday I, as a culture. I bought costumes for my pets back in, um, I think, I think the beginning of September. <laughs> Thor was not happy. It's okay. I have the best picture of him just mean mugging me in his little outfit. Wait, is that the one you sent me? Yeah. Oh, I love that picture so much. I'll put it on our Instagram. Yes. I'll have to find. Do you remember the time when Figaro was little? We yeah. would put her in the Build-A-Bear pumpkin <gasps> costume. Oh, my God. Because she was so small, she would fit in Build-A-Bear costumes. I so every that. year we would dress her up as the pumpkin and she would just sit there and stare at us. I hate this and I'm judging you. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to find we'll have to find all the pictures of the cat costumes for yes, if you find a picture of Figaro <laughs> in that costume, please send it to me. Oh yes. So speaking of commercial successes, mm -hmm. Halloween movies have come um a long way. Yeah. To being like box office hits. Mm -hmm. Classic Halloween movies included Halloween. Of course. Which there's apparently a fucking new one too, dude. Yeah, I think, it, I, I think it just came out. I, mm, I've i lost track. The um, last, I, I stopped, I, like, I used to love the Halloween movies. Yeah. Like, I would make my family watch those with me. I would make my family watch the Friday the 13th movies. Yeah. Like, Freddy versus Jason was a, like, staple. And I think that, like, that was the first horror movie that I'd ever, like, watched with my family. Because <laughs> my mom and one of my uh, younger sisters were away at, like, Girl Scout camp. Mm -hmm. And my dad was in charge of the other three of us. Oh. So his solution was, we're going to have, like, a junk food night. And we're all going to hang out and we're going to watch TV. That's, that's a true dad night. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so we had, like, watched something. And I don't remember what it was that, like, we all, like, kid movie that we all enjoyed. And by that time, the baby was asleep. Mm -hmm. And then my dad was like, all right, let's, let's, let's. Find something that your mom wouldn't let us normally watch. And I was like, yeah. And my, my <laughs> older sister was fashion. like, yeah. <laughs> and it was right around the time when The Ring came out. Uh oh. And my sister, my older sister was like, I want to watch that. And my father had already watched it. And it was like, not new, new, but it was like new to the point where it's just now on TV. Oh, yeah. Okay. And my dad's like, no, you don't. Because I don't want to watch that. <laughs> And she's like, no, I want to watch it. I want to watch it. I was like demanding to watch it. So my dad's like, yo, Lena, go get me a beer. We're going to see if she actually wants to <laughs> watch like, this. All right. So they watched three minutes of the beginning of that movie. And by the time I came back with the beer, Lindsay was crying. <laughs> and we did not watch that movie. <laughs> so she we fucked around and found out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then we, we ended up watching um, Freddy vs. Jason. Uh, yeah. You Which know, was, the natural next. Yeah. It was, it was still a horror movie. But, like, back then, yes, I did think that it was scary. Now, watching Freddy vs. Jason, mm -hmm. just nostalgically, I realize just how hilarious that movie is. Yeah, it's, you know, one of those just ridiculous ones. It's it's not something to take seriously. It's a great one, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I did actually find out a fun fact about uh, the Halloween movies yesterday from my friend Brandon, who's, like, a big horror movie buff. Oh, um, what's a fun fact? Apparently, the Halloween movies originally were supposed to be um, like a different story every movie. So like their their original plan was to make a new Halloween movie every year, but it was a different story. So it started out with Michael Myers and then another one was like um, a crazy like experiment gone wrong. But people loved Michael Myers so much that they just kept running with that yeah i mean <laughs> halloween the movie inspired other iconic you know quote-unquote slasher films uh-huh friday the 13th scream they were on elm street 
a nightmare on Elm Street, I can speak, <laughs> I promise. Um, but it also, like, sparked some more, like, family-friendly movies like Hocus Pocus and oh, Nightmare yeah. Before Christmas, Beetlejuice. Uh, it's the great pumpkin Charlie Brown. <laughs> so it, like, I see that. But I'm glad that it stuck to that original mm-hmm. same person each time. Because, honestly, Michael Myers is now, like, yeah, a staple. Staple classic mm-hmm. Halloween figure. Mm-hmm. Like, when... When people say Halloween, most people around our age, two things pop into our head. Mm-hmm. Trick-or-treating as kids. Yes. And Michael Myers. Yeah. The mask he wears and in those cos- in those as the costume. Yeah, and his predecessors, Jason, uh, Freddy. Well, no, no, he, he <clears throat> predecessed them. He sparked them. Yeah, that's what I mean. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Michael Myers and then those other guys came after, right? I'm not sure. If, like, successors then. Yep. So, so predecessor oh, so, yeah, before. Sorry. <laughs> I I do word good. I I do word better. (laughs) You have the masters. You do word better. That's true. (laughs) It's debatable, apparently. Oh, Lord. But, like, so, like, there's there's a lot to Halloween. And the way that it has grown in America is really, really cool. Oh, yeah. Um, So it's still, some people still have, like, the the ooky spooky. Mm -hmm. And I like how... After movies like Halloween, the spooky scary came back to Halloween. Yeah. And it kind of full circle. Yeah, and it kind of like opened the door for it to be okay that Halloween is scary again. Mm-hmm. Um, after like early nineteen hundreds where assholes were like, McCarthyism's great. Let's also take <laughs> the frightening parts out of Halloween, guys. Let's take all the things that are good about it and just throw them in the trash. Yeah. Like <laughs> Sure, it's fun to dress up. I go to the run fair enough that, yes, I agree. And yes, getting free candy is fun. Mm -hmm. Again, I do. I take my niece, still trick-or-treating. So I I get like two or three pieces of candy like thrown my way from the six-year-old who's like, (laughs) you get a piece and you get a piece and you get a piece. For your time. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Or, Or we do the, oh, Lydia, you don't like that kind. We oh, just, this is this is a gross oh, kind. No, no, you don't like that. This one's for adults. Yeah. Oh, honey, no, not with your teeth. Because <laughs> no, Smart. like, like we we don't let her have laffy taffy. Oh yeah, God no. But like, I can't even eat them. No, but I hate myself enough that I will eat her laffy taffy because <laughs> I like candy. Yes. I got I I like I had students come in to my office and they're like, Lena, you need to decorate. Oh boy. And I was like, okay, okay. So I like started, I got like a little nice Halloween bowl and I filled it with candy, but I'm also cheap because I don't get paid a lot. So I'm a, I'm a, a struggle. I'm a student affairs employee on a budget. Mm-hmm. So I filled that with, I think I got both bags for a grand total of 250 <laughs> But one bag was a bag of nerds of like the pink and um, purple boxes of nerds. Yes. And the other one were Smarties. And I put those Damn. in the bowl. I was like, look, I got candy for you guys. They looked at, the, they came in like a day later. They looked at the bowl and they were like, you need better candy. They straight flamed on yeah, you. They were just like, ew. <laughs> what the fuck is this? Where's the chocolate? Yeah, they legitimately, they came back in a week later and no one had touched the candy bowl. And they're like, seriously. Step it up. Like Hershey's, go get some Hershey's minis. They're not that expensive. And I'm like, you buy them and you put them in the fucking bowl and then you can have the candy. Help me. <laughs> lord (laughs) i don't get paid enough for that shit no i feel the same um i haven't decorated my office space at all and that's because all of my decorations are in my house (laughs) (laughs) like i can't i don't know if i can spend the money to decorate both so i'll put up some bats and call it a day yeah i mean well we're, we're we're having you're having a party yeah, so we're gonna party. Yeah, so I kind of needed all the decorations in my house. Yeah, <laughs> but it's fine. Halloween is on a Sunday, anyways. Yeah, <laughs> like you don't want to have Halloween and then on a Monday have like the first thing you see when you sit back at your depressing office desk be the Halloween stuff of the time that you wish was still happening. Yeah, those will, those will end up being all year decorations. I mean, I'm all for it. I. At my one depressing office job, um, someone had gifted me a little ghost, and he was like a little plastic ghost, but he was wrapped in sparkly like wire. Oh, like um, oh gosh, what's the fuzzy wire? Um, is it like 
Garland kind of. Kind of like Garland, but also like it was cleaner. that pipe cleaner. Yeah. Like sparkly white pipe cleaner. Cute. And he was wrapped up and he had little felt like little circles for eyes and a little circle for his mouth. And that was it. And he was the cutest thing in oh. the world. He sat on my desk year round. Yay. I made him a Santa hat. Oh. He got bunny ears. He was my little desk companion, and everyone thought it was the weirdest thing because I didn't have many decorations. He was the only one. <laughs> this is all I have. That, this is it. This is all you get from me. That's cute. I like that. <laughs> and he, he went through the holidays. He had his little bunny ears. Uh, I think at one point, someone, someone uh, gave him a little flag. I didn't make the flag for him, but <laughs> someone gave him a flag for 4th of July. See? Now so, he has fans. Yes. Does he have a name? No. Aww. He was he was just my little desk buddy. And I and after like leaving that job as unceremoniously as I did, I don't even remember where he went. So he's oh, somewhere. No. He's somewhere in like a <laughs> box of stuff from that desk that like probably should be thrown away. Well, you have to find him and then carry on the tradition. I think I do. I need to find this ghost. He'll be our little mascot. We'll mascot. We'll, we'll just have him sit on the desk. Call him Boo. Oh, boozy boo. There it is. There we go. We've named him. All right. Hey, Lauren. Hey, Lena. How do we do this? Do what? Make our podcast. Oh, we use Buzzsprout. Do you want to know one of the best things about it? What? You can start a show for free. That's my favorite four-letter F word. Buzzsprout is hands down the easiest and best way to launch, promote, and track your podcast. Your show can be online and listed in all the major podcast directories like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Buzzsprout wants their podcasters to succeed. So in addition to distributing your podcast for you, you'll get a great looking podcast website, detailed analytics, promotional tools, and... They'll even help you pick out the right equipment for you, and that's just scratching the surface. So follow the link in our show notes to let Buzzsprout know we sent you and get a great deal on every subscription level. If you sign up for a paid plan, this also gets you a $20 Amazon gift card that you could put towards, I don't know, a new microphone for your podcast. Oh, that's a low blow. (laughs) And of course, this helps support our show. So follow the link in our show notes to go to buzzsprout.com. And join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Lena, do you know what I love? A shot of Annie Get Your Gun with a chaser of ginger ale? I mean, yeah. But I also love not leaving my house. Dude, same. I love my bed and my blankets, and they have accepted me as one of their own, and if I leave now, they will never trust me again. Don't compromise that relationship. I can't. But especially right now. Yes, especially during a pandemic. Don't leave your house. And the last thing I want to do is go out to the grocery store when I could just have everything I need delivered to my house. Is that why you Instacart? That is exactly why I Instacart. They can deliver fresh groceries straight to my door sometimes in as little as one hour. Or I can schedule the delivery if I'm not going to be around. Instacart now also has multiple options based on your needs from pet stores to your local pharmacy and our personal favorite, even alcohol. Hell yeah. And they even have a section for people who use food stamps, so you can find exactly what you need all in one place. So follow the link in our show notes to go to instacart.com to get free delivery on your first order of $10 or more. Instacart. Never take a step in a grocery store ever the f*** again. And we're back. And we're back. All right. So now we're going <clears> to <throat> share some games with you that you can play if you want during Halloween, but I'm probably not going to play. I mean, well, the games we're going to talk about this week are games we totally would play. Yeah, they are. There are different like risk levels. Um, and so these are all kind of low risk that we're going to share this week. Which I want to know what our scale is. Yeah. Like, what's our level? Like, like, what, what, how do you define low, medium, and high? I guess we're going to find out because, uh, we're referencing these games from a book that I actually found online. It's, um, called Dangerous Games to Play in the Dark by Lucia Peters. And so we're not going to read all of the games in the book because there are a lot 
um, just because we don't want to spoil everything. If you want to find the book for yourself, go ahead. I found it on Amazon. It's really cool. But yeah, we're just going to cover like low risk games this week. And then there are like other games that are rated medium and high. So that'll be next week. That'll be next week. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get into the spooky, spooky, scary. Yeah, right before Halloween. Right before Halloween. <laughs> and then, you know what? If we play any of these games at Halloween party, yeah, we will let you know how it went. I'm sure it's not going to take much convincing from people. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> be like, hey, you want to play this weird game? No, no, no. First, we'll be like, hey, you want to do a shot? Yeah. All right, cool. You want, you want to do another <laughs> shot right now? Cool. Now let's play a game where we summon the devil. Let's go. Okay. Zero to 100. <laughs> That's our friend group. Anyway. That is our friend group. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now, of course, a lot of you may be familiar with this game. It's called Light as a Feather, Stiff as a Board. And it gives you some, like, uh, kind of stats before the game. So risk level low, objective, le- levitate a friend, additional warnings, heights, fire. I'm not sure why. Maybe we'll find out. Reward, define gravity. So each of these games comes with a potential reward at the end. Which I feel like the reward you have to like weigh is a high risk level (laughs) worth the reward you're going to get. Truly. All right. Here we go. How to play. Gather the players. A group of five to six people works best, but more may join in. Select your playing space too. Um, You'll need to find a quiet, dark room with lots of floor space. No other supplies are necessary, although you may choose to round up some blankets or pillows as well uh, as several small sources of illumination, such as flashlights, lanterns, or candles. Well, there's the fire. Yeah. There, there's, there's, there's the, the fire lighter. risk. Fire safety, everybody. Only you gonna can be prevent. Any, it's going to be the same if you use like battery-powered candles. Please don't set your house on fire. No, only you can prevent forest fires. Thank you. And house fires. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number two, uh, prepare the playing space, draw the curtains, or otherwise block out the windows so no light bleeds in from the outside. Move or rearrange any furniture or other items to clear the floor, dim the lights, or if you have decided to use candles or other small sources of illumination, light them up and turn off the rest of the lights in the room entirely. If you're using pillows or blankets, lay them down on the floor. Choose one player to be the levitator. This is step three. Um, have that player lie down on their back on the floor on top of the pillows or blankets. Um, if you have chosen to use them, close your eyes and cross their arms across their chest. The levitator should relax as much as possible, but should not move from this position. Open their eyes or speak until the conclusion of the game. Additionally, choose one player to be the guide. This player will direct the ac- actions to follow. The remaining players, along with the guide, are the lifters. Have these players and the guide sit around the levitator uh, spaced at regular intervals. If there are four players performing, the guide and lifter functions uh, position one at each of the levitator's shoulders and one at each of their knees. If there are five such players, position one at each of the levitator's shoulders and knees and the guide at the levitator's head. If there are more than five such players, space them out as evenly as possible with the guide at the levitator's head. That was a lot for step three. (laughs) There was a lot there. (laughs) But like, all right. So wouldn't it kind of be super easy to pick someone up if there were like eight of you around the person? Oh, yeah. And it was like a you-sized person. It's it's all evenly, like, um, evenly distributed. Yeah. Like, distributed evenly. Yeah. That's... Yeah, that's how I always envisioned this game. It was just kind of more like yeah, a test of strength. <laughs> kind of, yeah. You get the lightest person, then you try and lift them up with two fingers. Mm-hmm. Okay, so number four, stat four. Um, have all lifters and the guide slide the index and middle fingers of both their hands underneath the levitator's body. Mm-hmm. Then on the guide's signal, have the lifters attempt to lift the levitator... <laughs> into the air using only these fingers so like have you ever watched the movie the craft um i remember starting it at your house and then i fell asleep so yeah. no yeah okay <laughs> but so, i remember that game that they play yeah they, they played this game mm-hmm. and they made the inappropriate joke about oh so you just slide two fingers <laughs> under the come hither move yeah <laughs> 
So all I can think right now is of inappropriate sexual comments to mm-hmm. make. So I'm going to just <laughs> sip my, my donut cider here and let you continue. Why not? <laughs> I'm sorry, this burned my mind. It, just, it went right there, okay? <laughs> so, using only these two fingers. Oh, God. <laughs> this attempt will fail. Expect it to fail. Okay. I mean, I would expect that to fail, too. Mm-hmm. Just two <laughs> if fingers. You don't use those fingers right. Um, <laughs> failure at this stage is inevitable. When the attempt has concluded, all lifters and the guide should leave their fingers tucked beneath the levitator's body. The levitator should neither move nor speak. Now the true attempt begins. So dun, dun, dun. what was attempt number one? I guess what just was that? It's like just the a, a fuck up. Like come on, dude. You gotta exercise those fingers, get them nice and warmed up. You know what I mean? Or was it just e. to prove that it doesn't happen unless you do <laughs> these things? We have a few more steps to go. All right. All right. So number five. At this point, the guide should begin a quiet chant. She is looking ill. They should say, repeating the phrase softly. That's eerie. Wait, you have to repeat the phrase, she is looking ill? She is looking ill. She is looking ill. Dude, do you know that, like, <sighs> oh, you, just just you dressed in, like, any children's costume mm-hmm. with, like, just eerie makeup, mm-hmm. sitting in a corner, chanting, she is looking ill. She is looking ill. Like, can you imagine that? Like, that'd be the best <laughs> Halloween thing ever, just to walk into your house and have, really like, you in the corner being like, she is looking That's ill. That's how I'm going to greet my guests when they come during Halloween. <laughs> Do it. I dare you. So, the remaining lifters should pick up the chant, speaking the words along with the guide. She is looking ill. She is looking ill. Oh, she is looking ill. my God. When the guide feels the time is right, they should change the chant slightly. She's getting worse. Oh, my God. <laughs> God. The lifters must listen carefully as they chant when they hear the guide change the words. They too should change. She's getting worse. She's getting worse. She's getting worse. So wait, does it have to be a she? No, I'm I'm just no, I don't think so. Okay, because, because like my, my 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 picture is like we have a a a dude friend. Right, and I, he's like on the ground, and we're just chanting about some chick who's getting sick and like who looking worse. And all I can think of is this guy going, "Uh oh, I'm gonna get puked on." Right, I because like I think uh, this game is traditionally traditionally played by girls at sleepovers. That's that. That's what I was. Uh, so that's what I yeah. had believed. So, well, but, no, I mean, it's um. I have a. Let me try and remember the exact name of the book. I have like a a book of book for daring girls or something Uh and it's like girl scout activities but on steroids okay so like if you know how like the joke is that like girl scout teaches you how to sell cookies but Mm -hmm. boy scouts give you like life lessons the book for daring girls kind of combines a whole bunch of stuff to Mm -hmm. give you like really practical nice like life advice i like that yeah it's a really cool book i'll bring it over sometime for to share it with you it's very fun (laughs) But light as a feather, stiff as a board is in that book. Oh, fun. <laughs> and it's like, it, it does not have any of this stuff to yeah, lead up to it. like, uh, not what I grew up with. No. So this is terrifying a little bit. Yeah. But we're going to keep going. Yeah. But, um, you know, who's ever, whoever is the um, lifty or whatever, change their pronouns as you see fit. This is just what I'm reading word for word. Um, But yeah. And then... After, you know, she's getting worse, she's getting worse. The chant must change again, this time to she is dying. Oh again. <laughs> this is dark. Again, the lifters must listen carefully and follow the guide. She is dying. She is dying. She is dying. Once more, the chant must change. This time, it is simple and final. She is dead. <laughs> when the lifters hear the oh. guide shift, they too should adjust their chant. She is dead. She is dead. She is dead. Step six. Oh, my God. (laughs) The guide and lifters should allow themselves to fall silent. Then the guide begins a new chant. Light as a feather, stiff as a board. The lifters must also take up this chant, repeating it softly and continuously. Light as a feather, stiff as a board. Light as a feather, stiff as a board. Light as a feather, stiff as a board. 
As the guide and lifters chant, the guide should indicate that it is time to lift the levitator. Do not cease chanting as you lift. Do not lose focus as you lift. Chant and lift. There is nothing else. Chant and lift and the levitator will rise. Step seven. Oh my god. It continues. Oh god. (laughs) The guide should indicate to the lifters when to lower the levitator back to the ground. Do not cease chanting. Keep speaking the words light as a feather, stiff as a board. Move slowly and steadily. Bring your levitator back down. When the levitator has been returned safely to the ground, the guide and lifters should again allow themselves to fall silent. At the guide signal, all lifters should remove their fingers from beneath the levitator's body. Extinguish the candles, open the curtains, and turn on the lights. The levitator may now open their eyes, the levitator may now move, the levitator may now speak, but the levitator may never be the same again. <laughs> what that means specifically, I don't know. Yo. But, uh, there is some additional information afterwards. <laughs> so, the game may be played at any time. However, the greatest chance of success is at night. As of such, course. <laughs> of, of course, course. <laughs> it is recommended that you wait until darkness has fallen completely before beginning. During the chanting sequence, use whichever pronoun is appropriate. Okay, so okay, they cool. do. They, they did yeah, specify for it. Great. he, she, they, etc. Love it. Because um, we want everyone to play. <laughs> yes. We're one, equitable here. We want everyone to have a chance of being possessed. Yeah. <laughs> one variation um, on the game substitutes a storytelling sequence for the chanting sequence described in step five. In this variation, the guide must speak as if delivering a eulogy, eulogy for the levitator. They must describe in as much detail as possible how the levitator is meant to have, quote, died. At the conclusion of the story, they should begin the light as a feather, stiff as a board chant, proceeding proceeding as detailed in step six through to the completion of the game. Pay close attention to your levitator's behavior in the days following the completion of the game if they believe, if they behave uh, in an uncharacteristic fashion they may not be who you think they are anymore and that's the game okay there's a lot to unpack here (laughs) is there yeah because all right so you have some background in psychology i have Mm -hmm. some background in psychology if you repeat something yeah that's untrue Mm -hmm. enough times you believe it to be true oh yeah absolutely so if i repeat repeatedly if I repeat repeatedly, <laughs> if I repeat repeatedly, you're dead. Yeah. You're dead. You're dead. Eventually, I'm going to be like, am I really dead? Eventually, the person you're directing that to is going to be like, oh, my fucking God, I'm dead. This what is, happens? I'm dead. Is this like my purgatory? Is this the F? <laughs> Dude, I, I, that's, that's another topic for that, another that's thing. That's a whole spiral. <laughs> We're not going to go there. We can spiral later. Mm. No, but like if you, if you repeatedly say something to someone. Yeah. Especially if that someone is, like, inebriated. Oh, yeah. Then they're gonna believe it. Yeah. So if you're repeatedly telling someone, you're ill. Mm-hmm. You're ill. You're getting worse. Really messing You're getting with worse. Their, with you died. Sleep. You died. Your light as a feather stiff as a board. Yeah, and in this state, they're, like, in a meditative state. So it's kind of borderline hypnosis is what it sounds like to me. A little bit. So, it, yeah, understandable if your friend is kind of wonky the next couple days but maybe uh bless them or cleanse their aura in the days following this or some holy water on their heads before they leave just make them bathe in it you know what let's cover all our bases here or as my mom has recommended me do to uh certain individuals in my life make them drink it make them drink it slip it into some tea it's fine (laughs) they start to cough and choke well maybe they shouldn't be in your life oh my god get a priest (laughs) so you know what i will say low risk high reward Uh uh-huh i think we should play that game yeah i'd be down for playing the game i I think we'll have enough people eventually i'd be down to be like the levitatey okay like make me float bitch (laughs) we'll record it if we play any of the uh, any of these games we'll record this for you yeah because i would want to also watch after because I want to see me float. <laughs> Otherwise, I just know it's all in my head. <laughs> all right. What's our next story? Right. Our next game. Oh, yeah. 
is the doors of your mind. Oh, okay. So it's a low risk level. Um, also with the warnings of fire. Okay. Uh, the objective is to explore your own mind. That's terrifying. The reward is knowledge, self-actualization, and knowing who you truly are. Actually, that sounds very like that could be healing in a way. I'm interested to see. I think that this would be fun. Yeah. So how we play is you choose a partner to be your guide and select a quiet room to be your playing space. Then gather your supplies. You will need a few candles, matches or a lighter, and an alarm clock, a pillow, and a recording device are optional. Mm -hmm. You may begin at any time, although it's best to wait until a time when you feel relaxed and at ease. When the moment feels right, bring your guide and your supplies to your playing space. Close the door behind you to ensure that you won't be interrupted. Set up the playing space. Arrange your candles around the room however you'd like, and use the matches or lighter to light them. If you are using a recording device, begin recording now. Mm -hmm. Set the alarm clock to go off in one hour's time. Have your guide sit on the floor cross-legged. Then, lie down on the floor with your head in your guide's lap. You may also place a pillow in your guide's lap and position your head on top of the pillow. Sweet. Close your eyes. Mm. This sounds like very intimate things. Yeah. Yeah. Your guide should then... Oh, yeah, no, we, we get... Okay. <laughs> it gets more intimate. Okay. <laughs> your guide should then rub your temples gently with their fingers in slow, circular motions. Keep your eyes closed and focus on the sensation of your guide's movements. Relax. Let your mind drift. Then let yourself drift. Mm. Step six. When your guide senses that you are completely and utterly relaxed, they should begin the guiding process. The words they use to guide you are up to them. One recommended script is quite lengthy. Reading, you are at the end of a long corridor. Many doors line this hallway. They extend up and down the entire length of it, as far as the eye can see. Behind each door is a room. Begin exploring these rooms. Begin exploring these rooms. Describe to me everything you see, touch, hear, taste, and smell as you go. Other scripts, however, are quite sparse. Your guide may simply choose to chant red door, yellow door, any other color door, or seven doors, seven doors, several times before asking you to describe what you see. Now, I'm going to say seven doors, seven doors. That's interesting to me hmm. because... We're going real deep into like my my knowledge of stuff. Right. So Edgar Allan Poe yeah. wrote Mask of the Red Death. Yeah. And these are uh, And there are yeah, seven I remember that story with so, the, Yeah, mm -hmm. so there are seven rooms. All different colors. Those he wrote about the seven stages of a person's life mm -hmm. that was theorized by someone. And I can't remember if it was Shakespeare or if it was like Einstein or someone, like like yeah. someone, someone theorized, and I think it's a Shakespeare thing, that you have seven stages of life hmm. that range from your, your childhood, like infancy, to right. your dying days. Right. And that's why in Mask of the Red Death, he goes into the red and black room where yes. the specter finally catches up with him and kills him. Yep. So it's interesting to me that we're going through seven doors, seven yeah, doors, seven of, doors. A lot of interesting parallels in this one. Mm-hmm. All right, so step seven. In the physical world, keep your eyes closed. In your mind, open them. Look around. You should see the doors and or the corridor that your guide has described. What does your environment look like? Are your surroundings dark or light? Painted, wallpapered, or neither? Are the walls and floor stone, wood, something else? What illuminates the corridor? Does anything illuminate the, the corridor? How brightly is it illuminated? Are there any pictures or other items decorating the space? What do the doors along the corridor look like? Are they all the same? Are they all different? Take note of certain details about yourself as well. What are you wearing? Is there anything in your pockets? Are you carrying something with you? Is someone else with you? Describe what you see to your guide. Leave out no details. Mm. Begin to explore the corridor. There are no hard and fast rules for your exploration. You may travel up or down the corridor. You may enter any room. 
As you go, continue to describe what you see, touch, hear, taste, and smell to your guide. Should you choose to open any doors, examine each one closely before you open it. It may tell you something about what waits for you in the room beyond the door. What color is it? Does it have a particular size or shape? Does it open with a knob or a handle, or can you simply push it open? If it has a knob or handle, what does it look like? Mm. How does it feel in your hand? Is it cool to the touch, or is it burning hot? Some doors may not open. If you try a handle and find it locked, check your pockets. Do you have a key? If you do, try turning it in the lock. If you do not have a key, the key does not turn the lock, or if the door is blocked by some other barrier, a plank nailed across it, a missing knob, anything that might prevent you from opening it, do not try to force it open. You are not ready for whatever is behind it. Move along for now, although you may return to the door and try again later if you wish. Oh, wow. You do not have to open every door or any door. Listen to your intuition. If you feel unsettled by any given door, leave it closed and move along. If you open a door and see nothing behind it but an inky darkness, close the door immediately. Close that fucking door. (laughs) If you open a door and find a room full of clocks, do not touch any of them. Leave the room immediately. Oh. If you open a door and find an old woman, do not speak to her. Uh. Leave the room immediately. If you open a door and encounter a man in a suit, do not speak to him. Tell your guide immediately that you have found him. Your guide should then end the session as quickly as possible. Who are these people? If your guide is unable to end the session, leave the room immediately. Lock or bar the door behind you if you can. Step nine. When the alarm goes off, that is your guide's cue to conduct you back to the physical world. You may do so with whatever words they wish. The only requirements are that any doors that have been opened over the course of your journey should be closed again by the end of it, and that the final image in your mind should be of the corridor receding into the distance. In your mind, close your eyes. In the physical world, open them. Rise from the floor, turn off the recording device if you have chosen to use one, and extinguish the candles. You may review the recording whenever you wish. Welcome back. So. I have goosebumps. There are. A, I, I, when it said, like, if you see the man in the suit, tell the, your God you found him. I got Leave. like a shiver. <laughs> I will say that. Um, so additional information. You may play this game as many times as you wish. There are no limits to how many times you may explore your own mind. Know, however, that your mind is not necessarily a safe place to be. Mm-hmm. Lord, don't Holy I know it? Holy shit. And there's more I have to worry about? If you open your mind's eye in se- step seven and do not see the corridor or the doors, tell your guide and have them end the session immediately. It is also possible to become locked inside certain rooms or detained by people or other characters encountered within them. What? If this should happen, your guide, mu- again, must end the session immediately by whatever means necessary. What? Do not remain inside the corridor for longer than an hour and watch your step. You might not always be able to protect yourself from what you encounter. What the fuck? So my head isn't even safe? No. Clearly no. I mean, from what I know, sure, but like there are other entities I have to worry about. See, and like that's my question. Like who's the old woman and who's the man in the suit? I don't know. Because like I would think, I would think older person could Uh, just be like an older version of yourself yeah apparently not (laughs) but no and like in some in some like time travel conspiracies like you don't want to know anything about the future or about your future because you could fuck things up right that makes sense um but that being said who the fuck is a man in a suit i don't know why is he in my head hello so this is i think that's a game that we should play that's definitely one i'm willing to try like, I think that we should, because our episodes are typically an hour. Right. We should play this game. Do, like, a bonus episode of... As, like, a bonus episode. Ooh. And we can both take turns being, yeah. like, the guide or the person who's doing it. Yes. And just, like, go through these this that game. Because, honestly, it's, it's low risk. Yeah. And the reward is knowing your mind. But then there is, like, we have to, like, talk about, like, strategy of, like, if we find the man in the suit, what do we do? Yeah, who the... 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or, like, just describe him if you find him. Yeah, describe him really quick and then fucking leave. Yeah. Be like, dude, suit, three-piece, tailored, pinstriped, bow tie. Go, 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 go. (laughs) (laughs) You know, get through it. That one gave me goosebumps, like, real bad. I I don't know why. Because I think, like, knowing yourself is such an intimate thing. And it's so difficult to really, truly, like, know yourself. And, I mean, people aren't joking when they say everybody needs therapy. Mm -hmm. But, like, Mm -hmm. what that thing described. What this was? Oh, my God. Is scary. That's terrifying. Yeah. So willing to dip my toes in it, but holy shit. Yes, I'm I'm totally willing to do that one. Because to me, that just sounds like meditation and... It, it does. You know, self-exploration. It's not anything to do with, like, the demons. No, it's it sounds like a very, yeah, deep form of therapy, hypnosis meditation, but, like, with some twists. <laughs> yeah. But also, I would have to ask, because clearly, whoever's playing this game has read this book. Mm-hmm. And whoever's, like playing that game to follow those rules specifically, has read them. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that subjectively speaking, you would expect now to see some of that stuff? Right. So, like, it's one of those things where you're like, hmm, makes you think. Things that make you go, hmm. Hmm. Still a fun one to try, though, if you want to get to know yourself. I'm, I'm down. I'm down. I trust you enough to rub my temples in the dark. I, and I trust you enough to lay my head in your lap <laughs> with candles. <laughs> All right. Our next game. I think it comes from the same chapter. Oh, God. It's called the Red Book Game. Oh, I don't know if I like that. Mm. I have my feelings about red doors. I don't know about red books. Here we go. Red rum. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, the risk level is low. The objective is to ask your most pressing questions and get some answers. Additional warnings, fire. I'm going to guess candles again. Probably. I'm hoping. (laughs) If that's the only warning I need, fine. Yeah. Uh, And then reward information. Just It just says information? Yep. Okay. So this sounds like another self-exploration kind of one. Okay. Um, So how to play. Choose a partner. More The more players join in, uh, more, sorry, more players may join in but at least two players are required for the game to work. Mm. Uh, Select a playing space as well, ideally a dark, quiet room. Step two, gather your supplies. You will need one book, at least one candle, matches or a lighter, and a sense of curiosity. (laughs) (laughs) I have a sense of curiosity. (laughs) Say that it has to be a red book. Hmm. Um, It doesn't say. Uh... But let's see what else. Um, Note that there are some specific requirements the book and candle must satisfy. Oh, here we go. Okay. The book must be hardcover. The cover must be red. And there should be absolutely no images, illustrations, or photographs anywhere inside. It must contain only words. The candle, meanwhile, must also be red. Hmm. These are very specific, like, things to find. Like, that's hard to find a book. And try to find a Stephen King book. Stephen King books sometimes have illustrations at the beginning of the chapters. Oh, shit. Yeah. Well, looks like we got to take a trip to the bookstore. Yeah, we do. (laughs) It's going to be like a cookbook or like a pregnancy book. It's going to be what to expect when you're expecting. And it's going to be like (laughs) the rosy bright pink red instead of like red. (laughs) Step three. (laughs) Sorry. Oh, there we go. (laughs) That's it. No. (laughs) You may begin at any time, although nighttime is recommended. Take your supplies and your partner or partners to your playing space. Then, draw the curtains and turn off the lights. Sit on the floor opposite the other player or in a circle if there are three or more players. Place the candle or candles between you and light them. Then, place the book where all the players can reach it. Step 4. Now ask for permission to enter the game. To do so, close your eyes, place the palm of your hand on the cover of the book, and ask aloud. Red book, red book, may I play your game? Keeping your eyes closed, open the book to a page, any page. Open it to whatever page feels feels right, not necessary. Um, Then place your finger somewhere on that page, again, trusting your instincts to land on whatever spot feels right. Open your eyes and read the sentence your finger is pointing to. This sentence is the answer to your question. 
How do you interpret it? If it is positive or affirmative, permission has been granted to you. You may continue to play. If it is negative or nonsensical, however, you have not received permission. Try again, closing your eyes, place your palm on the cover of the book, asking permission, and letting your finger fall on a random sentence on a random page. If you continue to receive negative or nonsensical answers, it's best to give up for now and try again another time. So, like, I don't, I think I've played a version of this game. Really? Not with a red book and not, like, asking permission for it. But, like, something that's very prevalent amongst, uh, like, non-denominational Christians Mm -hmm. is to take the Bible and ask a question in your mind. And then open the Bible to any verse with your eyes closed and then instinctively put your finger on the Bible. That's interesting. And get your answer. Mm. Or get, like, what you need. Right. So I have done this game many times. (laughs) But in a completely different context. In a completely different context. Wow. Okay. I want to know more about this one, though, because I kind of want to try this. There's a dark side to it. There's a dark side to this one. Oh, my gosh. Okay. (laughs) Each player must ask for and pre- and receive permission to enter the game in order for the game to proceed. If some players do not receive permission, uh, either have them leave the playing space and continue without them or end the game and try another time. Um, oh, so they can't, like, be in the room? I Yeah, I guess not. Damn. Like, nope, not today, buddy. Get out. <laughs> Peace. Go drink in the kitchen. We're <laughs> playing a game up here. <laughs> you can't play with us. <laughs> Step five. Once all players have been granted permission, it's time to begin asking your questions. This should be easy for you now. It's just like asking for permission to enter the game. Close your eyes, place the palm of your hand on the cover of the book, ask your question aloud, open the the book to whatever page feels right, and drop your finger down somewhere on that page. Then open your eyes and read the sentence on which your finger has landed. This is your answer, although, again, you must interpret it correctly in order to find the meaning in it. After the question has been answered, pass the book to another player. It's their turn now. They, too, may ask a question using the method previously described. The book should uh, pass to another player for each question. The same player should not ask two questions in a row. Step six. What happens if they ask two questions in a row? I have no clue. I wonder if it will say. Mm-hmm. I Maybe. guess it's just like a general rule. Don't be greedy. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> give you know, friend. puff, puff, pass. But I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> pass the duchy to the left-hand side. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Step six. When you, when you have asked all your questions and received all your answers, you must ask for permission to leave the game. As before, oh God, close your eyes, place the palm of your hand on the cover of the book, and ask aloud, red book, red book, may I leave your game? If the response gives you, if the, if the response the book gives you is positive, you may leave the game. However, if it is negative or nonsensical, you do not yet have permission to leave the game. Ask again. Keep asking until you receive a positive answer. Again, each player must ask for and receive permission to leave the game in order for the game to end. It sounds a lot like a Ouija board. Yo, this is like, so why can't I leave without getting permission? Because it's, I imagine, like a Ouija board, it's like opening a portal. Like, I know. you're contacting yeah. something, and if you don't close off that communication, it's going to follow you That's fair. into whatever. So, right. Have you ever read the uh, bedtime stories from, like, Harry Potter? Mm. So, in, in one of the books, Hermione is gifted, like, the, the bedtime stories mm. um, no, after Dumbledore's read. funeral, and, like, one of them is, like, About a a cauldron that like sprouts a foot and like follows somebody around. All I'm fucking thinking right now is that the red book is gonna (laughs) sprout a fucking foot and like thump after you if you don't close them. It's it's your new pet, like uh, what the Adams family has. Yeah. A thing. Yeah. Little hand. Yes, it becomes the thing. (laughs) All right. Step seven. 
When every player has received permission to leave the game, close the book, extinguish the candle, open the curtains, and turn on the lights. Are you satisfied with what you know? Oh, no. Hmm. Additional information. You may ask any question you like of the red book, but before you ask, make absolutely certain you want to know the answer. Knowledge, once learned, cannot be unlearned, and some questions are better left unanswered. Be polite. If you are unsatisfied or frustrated by your answer, do not take it out on the book. Above all, do not begin asking questions or attempt to end the game without asking for and receiving permission to do so. This game does not pose any does, bleh, this game does not pose many risks to its players if played correctly, but if steps are skipped, all bets are off. And that's all it says. What does that mean? I don't know. So play with caution, be polite. All right, yeah. Clearly. Oh my god. <laughs> There's also this one rule that you and I have of don't fuck with Ouija boards. Exactly. And this is like airs on the side of uh, Ouija board territory. Yeah, so. sounds like a Ouija board. Yeah. Mm. All right. All right. All right. Our last game for this afternoon. Okay. Okay. So the compass game. Yes. Risk level low. Additional warnings. None. None? There are no additional warnings okay. to this game. That's a good sign. Um, the objective is to use a bow compass as a handset oh. and receive answers oh. to your right. most pressing questions. I don't know, man. That sounds like there's like of... yeah, that's a pan a pan shed is that's that's the thing for the Ouija board, right? Yeah. All right. The reward is information. Okay. You know what? Maybe if we read the actual like Thing in the beginning of the <laughs> instructions we might learn more about these games that's true but we'll read them later you have to buy the book yes um step one gather your supplies you will need a bow compass a pencil a large sheet of paper and questions any number of questions concerning anything about which you are curious questions to which you absolutely must know the answers wait no that makes sense does it Questions to which you absolutely must know the answers. Like that you want to know the answers yes. to, but don't, or you have to know the like, question, the answers to the questions you're asking. Uh, I interpret it as like, you really want to know the answer to this question. Like okay. it's been bugging you a lot. Okay. I, that's fair. If you want to play with partners, gather them now too. This game may be undertaken by any number of players or it may be played alone. You do not need to position yourself in any particular kind of playing space, but a quiet room where you're unlikely to be interrupted is recommended. You do not need to play at any specific time of day. Prepare your board. This is a Ouija board. Prepare your board. <laughs> Fit the pencil to the compass and use it to draw a circle on the sheet of paper. I have one of these. Write the letters of the alphabet along the outer edge of the circle. Write the numbers zero through nine along the inner edge of the circle and write mm. the words yes and no in the innermost portion of the circle. This is a fucking Ouija board. This sounds close to like a mixture of um, a Ouija board and uh, the Charlie Charlie game. I don't know the Charlie Charlie game. I don't know the specifics of it, but like the yes or no written down is one of the things. The, yeah, but like to me, this sounds just like a circular Ouija board. Yeah, basically. Yeah. The A, zero, and yes should be at the top of the circle. The letters and numbers should be evenly spaced around the circle, and the no should be at the bottom of the circle. So, like, you as an artist would have to draw this for us. Okay. Because <laughs> my, my dumbass would be sitting there for, like, eight hours later trying to, like, evenly space 26 letters out in a circle. And I'd be like, it's not right. Here's, here's the radius. The things aren't matching up. It's not good. <laughs> uh, so you would have to do that for us. Got you. Step three. Have all participating players gather around the board. Form the legs of the compass into a right angle. Yeah. Um, Help me. Uh, so Describe this to me. Actually, I'll show you real quick. Okay. Because I have I'm, one. I'm getting confused because when I think of a compass, I think of like... Yeah, the, the like... A magnetic round, round thing. thing that, like, the arrow points north. Yeah, yeah, I'll show you. One sec. Now, or are we talking about a compass as in the math tool? Okay. That might make more sense because the math tool has legs. 
Yeah, see, like, what I use it for is... Ooh! Sorry, I just almost oh, dismantled my entire Elle. setup. Sorry, L. He's fine. Um, yeah, so, like, what I use them for is drawing, literally drawing perfect circles for art and shit. Okay. But, yeah, you. this is, like, kind of like a math compass. It has little legs. It has the pencil in the one and the needle on the other. Yeah, and you just, and you, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's literally a compass. Yes. Okay. I was thinking the other thing. No. And I was very confused for a moment there. All right, go get your compass. We're going to do this. Uh, right now? No, not right now. We'll we don't do... have time. Yeah, we don't have time. All right. <laughs> Another time. Another time. Stand the compass upright on its point in the center of the circle. The leg with the pencil should be pointing to... Okay, if I had just read the next sentence, no. I would have understood all of this. <laughs> This book is a lot more descriptive than we get it. Give it yeah, credit for. it is. We just ask. We we like jump the gun on asking questions because we get impatient. Is what it really is. Um, the leg with the pencil should be pointing out to the edge of the circle like the hand of a clock, and place one finger on the hinge to hold it loosely in place. If you were to flick the leg with the pencil, the compass should be able to spin freely around the circle. Mm. Have all players ask for permission to enter the game. Doing so is straightforward. The player who is balancing the compass on its tip should simply make their request. The recommended script is, may I play your game? But you can free you can feel free to alter it as you see fit and watch the compass leg as it swings around the circle. Mm. If the answer is positive, for example, the compass leg lands on yes or spells out something similarly affirmative. If the player has received permission, However, the answer is negative or nonsensical. For example, the compass leg lands on no or spells out something similarly negative or senseless. The player has not received permission. Mm. If there are multiple players, pass the compass to another player to, after receiving or being denied permission by performing a trade-off. Have the player receiving the compass place their finger on the hinge just as the player giving up. The compass removes their own finger from it. Do not let the compass drop during the trade-off. Oh, God. If you are the only other player and do not receive permission, destroy your paper immediately. <sighs> oh, okay. Now is not your time. Try again another day. If there are multiple players and some receive permission while others do not, mm-hmm. the players who do not receive permission should leave the room immediately. <laughs> Get out. Yeah. Get out. <laughs> the players who have received permission may continue, although it would be wise to exercise caution as you proceed. Wow. Because, yeah, it's only selecting a few of them. Yeah. Oh, my God. If you have made it this far in step five, you may begin to ask your questions. To do so, simply follow the same procedure. Mm-hmm. While holding the compass upright by its hinge, ask a question aloud and watch the leg swing, keeping track of it as it goes. It may answer a yes or a no. It may spell out a reply. And it may incorporate numbers into its response. It is up to you to interpret the compass's response. If the leg remains stationary, ask a different question. A non-answer is still an answer. Oh. Only the player holding the compass may ask questions. One player may ask as many questions as they like before passing the compass off to another player. But this is not a puff puff pass moment. (sighs) The group may continue to ask questions until the answers become slow, disconnected, or nonsensical, or until they cease entirely. It's like, move on. Next person, please. Yeah. When you have determined that it's time to stop, each player must ask for permission to leave the game. Follow the same procedure used to enter. If you do not receive permission to leave, apologize and ask again. Do not leave the game without securing permission. When all players have received permission to leave, say thank you, then destroy the sheet of paper completely as, pos- as completely as possible. Additional information. You may ask a wide variety of questions and queries, but some questions are best avoided. Do not challenge your correspondent to prove its existence. Do not ask if it is good or bad. Do not make jokes while playing and never Ever give your correspondent permission to enter your box? Oh, your, but the last sentence feels Listen. unneeded. <laughs> oh, wait, no, there's another page. There's another page of, of additional information, guys. Additionally, it is not recommended you play this game too frequently or that you follow 
any orders the compass may give you, particularly when they are unsolicited. Oh. That is, if the orders appear independently, independently, or any questions of any questions you have asked. Oh. Above all, do not allow the compass to drop at any point throughout the game. If the compass falls over, remove the pencil from it, immediately destroy the sheet of paper, and vacate the location in which the game is initiated. Oh, God. Give the compass to one player, the pencil to another, and then have these two pen... Oh, shit. What? Have these two players travel as far away (gasps) from one another as possible to bury their given (gasps) objects. Do not return to the game location until this task has been completed. Do not fail to complete this task. What the fuck? So we're not we're not doing that. Oh my god! I was gonna say like Learn. this sounds like a safer version of the Ouija board, but it's not. No, this sounds like a worse version of the Ouija board. What the fuck? No, no. <laughs> I. That's so scary. So, as far as possible, like okay, realistically, I could drive to fucking Florida. Yeah, like <laughs> if we, if I take some PTO, I can just drive as far as my car will take me. And yeah. Just, yep. And then states bury over. something. <laughs> so is that what we have to do? Um, yeah, as a precaution, even like if the game is successful, that's something I would totally do. I don't know if I like this game. Yeah, we'll we'll table that one and stick with uh, the the slumber party games. Yeah, for we'll, now we'll we'll play light as a feather, stiff as a board because <laughs> I have to be honest. That that sounds like a more dangerous, more risky version of a Ouija board. Because mm-hmm. think about this. You have to yeah. balance a point yes. with your finger and then to switch off. Pass it off. I have to let go and you have to catch it with your finger before it falls. That's risky business. Do you understand how like sober everyone has to be to play that game safely? Uh yep. <laughs> so that's not happening anytime soon. And like what constitutes a fall? Like if I catch it when it's like this. With yeah, my I, finger and then pull it up. I think as long as it doesn't actually, like, fall completely onto the surface, you'd be fine. But just don't let that happen. Oh, my God. See, I was thinking it was a little safer because, like, oh, you can just destroy the, the, the board, essentially. Yeah. You can't do that so easily with a regular Ouija board. But, like, no. no. This one's, like, so... This sounds worse. It's a lot worse. This sounds like so much more anxiety. Yikes. That was definitely one of the scarier ones, I think. Uh, yeah. Especially with the second page saying, like, first of all, who needs to be told? Who, who, who playing these games need to be told? Do not let something enter your body. I mean, it, if it's in the book, I guess it had to be said. I know, but like, who? Well, well playing. I it was like, yeah, of, I sure. I can think of a Do person. You, you've watched Ghost Adventures, right? Oh, that's true. <laughs> On more than one occasion, Zach Bagans has been like, use my energy to give us a sign. Of oh, <laughs> shit, presence. you're right. Oh, he would totally do it. Zach Bagans is the one that needs this rule. Sorry, Zach, it's true. Well, and you know what? Now, if I think too much about it, um, the guys from BuzzFeed. Yeah, Ryan and Shane. Yeah, Shane, Shane needs that rule. <laughs> if I think too hard, Y'all are I reckless. understand. Yeah, reckless. Why the fuck would you invite something in? Why would you say to eat someone else's heart? Come on, guys. It needs to be said. It needs to be said. Oh, Lord. All right. (laughs) Yeah, so tune in next week. And if you thought those were freaky, we have like a plethora of high risk games coming your way. So we we played the low risk. Yeah, those freaked me out. We read the low risk. We're going to we're going to play or not. No, maybe play. Maybe play a low risk game, Mm -hmm. but definitely read. The high risk games. Yeah, I'm I'm excited for those because the low risk ones even freaked me out. So yeah, yeah, stick around. That'll be like Halloween time. I'm it, very excited. It, well, I'm too. I'm so excited for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as always, if you have ever let me read the new card yeah, that Lauren has done us. Postcards. Have you ever seen a ghost? Mm-hmm. Rode shotgun in an alien spaceship. Maybe punched Ted Bundy in the face. Wish. We want to hear about it. Go to passmethebooze.com slash submit to send in your stories to be read on the show. Please send us your spooky stuff. Please. We it would be super cool to have some stories to read for Halloween. Yes. Oh, my gosh. So. Bonus episode. Yes. Bonus content. Bonus content. So send it in, please. Yeah. All right. All right. I would like another one of these uh, ciders. Yeah, these are donuts. Really good. <laughs> 
Stay spooky. Stay spooky, y'all. <laughs>